Okay, so we'll, we'll start again. Okay, four part if you want. The le mieux and the truth. The, uh, there is some difficulty to make of le mieux a completely realistic painter. Uh, um, I would say I see two, uh, two main one. The first one will be his style. Uh, uh, the second one will be the point of view he took on reality. And the uh, the problem of style, I think, is quite obvious. Uh, you could find it under the pen of Lemieux very often uh, mentioned that he likes uh, trompe l'oeil type of painting. Uh, uh, just to fix the idea, I will put two examples. And even this horrible thing on, on the right here was, was done by Yvan Lelorin Albright, who is an American painter that is quoted very favorably by Lemieux. Uh, especially in this little catalog that they published at the National Gallery in, in 67. Uh, he's quoted there that he, he liked this painting. He doesn't like the morbidity of it, but he liked the fact that this guy could be so realistic and so uh, um, make uh, not only realism, but a kind of morbid type of realism. Uh, and the other example I give that, it's uh, William Harnett, the old violin. This is a perfect example of trompe l'oeil in which the painting is so accurate, if you want, in terms of uh, depiction of reality, that uh, you hesitate to see if it's not real envelope there on a real uh, sheet of music was, was put there, or even this little hat that you have there, uh, we call, uh, glued on the wall. Um, so if you look at it very uh, from close, you, you will see that there's nothing written on it. It's just little, it imitate character, but, but, but you don't see them really. Uh, so you, you, have, you do have in Lemieux uh, very, uh, quite often uh, a kind of admiration for this type of painting, saying that it's beautiful, but it's not a painting that he does. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not a way in which he wants uh, to do. And I think the, the, main, the main criticism you can make of all trompe painting in a way it's that, and it narrows so much the possibility of the painter uh, that uh, great painter uh, at a certain point uh, don't need that. They want to, to get out of this uh, narrowness. For instance, if you want to have uh, with the old violin this impression that you are really in front of the real thing and not in a depiction of something, it is uh, very important that the depth or that the three-dimensionality of the picture will be very reduced. Uh, that's why they tend to present something with flat already, uh, like for instance an envelope or a sheet of music or even, uh, well, the violin, but uh, not, uh, you will not show, show him in three dimension or with an angle, you will show it flat on, on a background. And because of that, when you move a little bit in front of the picture, you hesitate to see, is it a real violin or, or is it something that you just depicted there? So this kind of very narrow type of range in which trompe l'oeil could, could work is one of the limits, uh, uh, if you want, of the genre. And, and also the fact that to be very efficient, the trompe l'oeil should be able to uh, blur the distinction between the painting and its environment. And uh, I will quote you just a little fact uh, that uh, is related to Osias Le Duc, uh, uh, kind of trick that he did. Uh, you see, he had a little studio in Saint-Hilaire where he used to work. And he didn't want to be bothered by too much people, so he painted on the door of his studio a little high piece, like this very, very realistically painted, and so people were coming to see if he was in, and what they could see, it was nothing, of course, <laughs> huh, you see. Well, we, we call it in French a judas, uh, kind of a little uh, eyepiece like this that you, you could look through and, well. Then, in order that this type of trompe l'oeil could be efficient, it has to be painted in such a way that you cannot see where the painting starts and when the environment, when the door starts, uh, where there is a kind of homogeneity between the painting and the context. This is never true, of course, of any trompe l'oeil painting because very often you have a frame around it, you can detach it from the wall and all this, and right away this kind of illusion uh, disappears. Uh, so there is a kind of criticism of trompe l'oeil uh, in which you could say uh, Le Mieux agree, uh, and even with some admiration for that type of painting, decided that he's not, uh, he's not interested in that. The other, and I think a more profound reason, 
it is that uh, it is point of view on reality. The, you will see there is a very specific <coughs> uh, context in which suddenly uh, Lemieux was able to see his country in a very different way uh, that he ever did before. Is it uh, upside down? Oh yes, you're right. C'est embêtant, oui. Because the sky is, is low. And this is a also a kind of... Uh, can you change it? Can you just put it? <laughs> voilà, thank you. Thank you. Much better. Oui. Là, c'était le mieux. Avant, c'était abstract art. I don't know what. OK. <laughs> le train midi, hein? the uh, a very famous painting was at the National Gallery, 1956. Okay, what happened is that Lemieux had the chance, if you want, to be out of his country and to come back and to see it very differently. Uh, and this is what I call this point of view suddenly that could change completely the, the look that he had on what he was very familiar with since he was, uh, he was uh, living there. And I would quote you uh, uh, a passage of a beautiful article that Gabriel Roy, uh, the famous novelist, uh, wrote about him in uh, La Revue Art et Pensée, and in which she described exactly wh what happened to Lemieux. She says, for somebody like him, who is so aware of the insecurity of man and the precariousness of things, who avoid anxiety only when protected by tenderness or by all comforting routine, to be torn apart from his usual milieu was shattering. If you want to discover new lands, you must leave the shore. N but the new land, uh, the, the new land that Lemieux discovered on his where on his way back home. Uh, thi this is the uh, great intuition of Gabriel uh, Roy that the new lands that Lemieux discovered was his own country in a way. And he was able to do it because he, he got a bursary from Canada Council to, to, uh, to go in 56 in, the, in, in Europe, to visit museum and all that, and like all artists expect to do. He was a little bit uh, not very happy. Of, of this trip was very happy to come home, like she described him, also a man of routine, a man who was shattered by this uh, kind of experience. And then coming back, saw suddenly the country like nobody else have seen it before and could suddenly have seen a truth, if you want, uh, a kind of new, uh, new reality. I continue the quotation. She says, uh, uh, he saw then the country like no other Canadian painter had seen it before, even in a way that we hesitate ourselves to recognize rather than to agree to this hard truth, so much snow, so much expense of insensible white, such coldness of the soul, steps without hand, so discouraging horizontality. Yeah. And, and it beautifully describes, I cannot put it better, but I think it's, it's exactly what happened. And if you want then to describe what is the situation of Lemieux in comparison with his country, I would say he's a visitor. Uh, you see it suddenly as a visitor, as if he was a not a tourist, but maybe I prefer visitor in his own thing. And indeed, you have paintings in which the title uh, allude to that. This one is called Le Visiteur du Soir, uh, the, the, visitor, the evening visitor. Uh, it represents the priest uh, going to bring the last sacrament to uh, some uh, people dying somewhere. So the landscape is very, very uh, minimal, if you want, because he have only one thing in mind, it's to reach his house and make his ceremony and help this poor man to die. So the evening that allowed in the text is deaf, of course, is not, is not the, uh, so much the atmosphere that you see there. Uh, the simplification of, of the picture, but the most important, the attitude of Lemieux himself is like the one who sees the things from outside, who is suddenly uh, a visitor. I spoke m many times of distance and detachment uh, in this lecture about Lemieux. Here you have another form of it, not ironical, not uh, a detachment without interest. In the contrary, it's suddenly like a realization of, of some, some deep truth that uh, have uh, completely escaped him uh, before him. When he, when he felt that, when he find that, you could say that all the development of the painting of landscape of Lemieux was uh, in germ in this intuition. And then it will develop, it will go on and on. And I think in a way, in a very philosophical way. Uh, 
Uh, I will suggest uh, that even you could make a Heidegger uh, translation of, of his painting. This one is called La Tombée du Jour. It belongs to a private collector who is in the, the room here. I will not name him. And uh, 1964, and in which you have a specific conception of color, uh, which is very important in Lemieux. Lemieux, I've said very often that one of his obsessions is the depiction of time and of uh, duration. Uh, and, uh, okay, uh, this, and he says, I ask of space to depict time, in a way. Say a huge space, a very empty space, in a way, could suggest uh, the kind of infinity of time. Uh, but I think also the color that he used is also typical of that. He says himself, I'm not a colorist, I'm a valorist. Okay, he alludes there to a distinction which is important in painting between uh, color as you, if you want, and color as value. Uh, a you will be uh, red, yellow, green. Uh, uh, it's just a depiction of, of the color, of the pigment, if you want. But the value will be all the variation you could put inside of one of the you. So for instance, you will take uh, green, and you will have dark green and you have clear, um, a much lighter one and everything. Inside of this same color, you could have all type of variation. And so this is the value in painting. This is the, what the term uh, designates, let's say, this possibility of a big range of nuance inside of a specific color. Uh, you could get with red and pink at one end and dark red at the other, so all these variations. Uh. And if you think of it, this type of definition of color as value is closer to time. Because, of course, it's true uh, value that you could suggest, let's say, certain illumination of uh, the landscape. It could be uh, the night, it could be the day, it could be a different time of the day also. You could suggest all these nuances through the value and not only through local color, let's say, uh, who will just give you maybe uh, the situation under general illumination, let's say at noon or something like that. Uh, and, uh, and so this, again, this will add a kind of dimension of duration to uh, Lemieux approach uh, to painting. He went very far in this uh, direction. Uh, you have some painting, this, like this one, it's called Moonlight. Uh, it's even hard to see uh, in slide, in which then you would say, okay, this is completely dark. Uh, and night have always been a kind of fascination for, for certain amount of painters uh, that tried, uh, you remember Van Gogh uh, did that, uh, Picasso also. I th many painters were, were interested by this subject matter. I think I, I mentioned it also in the lecture about uh, Harris, uh, if I remember well. And uh, okay, here you have, of course, the theme almost at, 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 uh, in its purity. Uh, moonlight, you see vaguely the moon on the top there. Whoop, that was too dramatic. The uh, here, and two hills, and again, a kind of minimal type of landscape. Uh, this goes very much in the, the same direction. Uh, the, uh, if, if we want to know, okay, which kind of uh, revelation, let's say, that uh, uh, Lemieux had when he came back like this and he see his country differently, I think we could uh, try, uh, I will try this, but I, I give it all with all, uh, uh, with, with trembling a little bit. But let's see, this uh, painting is called Chemin qui mène nulle part, uh, kind of way that ends up nowhere uh, of uh, 1956 again. It's a very important year because this is the, the year of the impact of, uh, of the rediscovery of the revelation, if you want, in front of his country. Uh, curiously, this is the title also for Heidegger book. Chemin qui mène nulle part, And uh, so when I see that, I said, what is it? Lemieux could read this, and then, okay, you, as a good historian, you check your date, and uh, it doesn't work. Uh, this is 56, and the, the, uh, the book of Heidegger was published in 62, so it, it cannot be. But on the other hand, this is, there is an article in the Heidegger book which is called L'origine, oh, I read it in French, but The Origin of the Work of Art. Uh, in which he gave an example, very different from Lemieux, I will put it uh, in parallel. He, he start with this Van Gogh uh, painting of boots of peasant and try to explain what is his conception of the work of art. Uh, 
so I, I will describe it a little bit to you, and then I will try to apply that to Lemieux. Okay, what Heidegger says, he says, okay, in these booths, what you see, it is uh, not only a kind of realistic depiction of a product, in a way, because shoes, after all, is a production of man, but also uh, you, you begin to associate it with all the meaning of these shoes. For instance, the toil of the peasant is walking along the furrows, the, the fact that the, the sky is low, and you begin more and more to associate it with the whole context of this peasant woman who wear these shoes. Huh? As if what uh, um, uh, Van Gogh wanted to depict there is not only what we see, but also this universe, this world of this peasant woman uh, through one aspect of his uh, costume, if you want. And he says, then you have a kind of a, a, a dialectic, if you want to kind of fight between two ideas. You have the hearth, uh, which is connected to these shoes on, a, on a one hand, and you have also a world as a peasant, a mental world, if you want, a spiritual world also who is expressed there. And he says you have always this kind of conflict between herde, the, the hurt, and welt, the, the world, uh, in each painting like this, where, where you can to, to uh, organize them together. Uh, painting are always allegorical in that sense, that means make us speak more of what we see. Uh, in Greek, allo agorein means to speak a lot, to speak a lot. An allegory is, is like you, if you speak about the, the painting, and it's also symbolical because it put together things. Uh, the painting gives you to see something, and then suddenly you can associate it with more and more and more things. Uh. And in a way, this definition that Heidegger did apropos uh, this Van Gogh painting, I think, in a way, when you go back to the uh, Lemieux painting, it seems much more akin to him because you have, you do have the hurt on one hand, and you do have also this kind of world that seems to be threatened by the the hurt is so present, is so uh, invading in, in in the picture, and the little Quebecois world that seems to be expressed from time to time in the picture seems weak, seems not imposing. Huh? not as imposing, let's see, like in the Van Gogh picture, where the world of the peasant is the main, uh, the main item there, and the herd should be just suggested there. Uh. So uh, when you have this key, I think you could almost make of Lemieux a metaphysical painter. Uh. He, see, he sees the, I would say, the importance not only of the, of the, the landscape it's itself, but also as a place. Uh. And this is also, I for me at least, a kind of an ambiguity of Lemieux picture. It's very good uh, to have this feeling of the hurt and of the, uh, the let's say also, the idea that uh, technique today are destroying everything and uh, that we should go back to, to the world as it is, you see. And it's probably this is one of the, the main message of, of Lemieux, you see that, uh, okay, forget about all the technique and all that. He says once that he wanted to represent a city completely empty of people, say as if the, the city will be something that we forget about and we get only this kind of landscape of snow like this. Uh. So he have this, this idea of a very strong link to a place, <coughs> but remember that the place and the feeling and the attachment for a place is also the beginning of a division in humanity between people who belong and strangers. Uh, and this is the ambiguity, I think, of Lemieux also. I, okay, it's very nice that you, you stress the landscape, you stress the, 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 the belonging to a place, but also, even if he's not a nationalist, even if he doesn't want to, to claim for one region only, the fact also that he, he, he make us go back to, he want to return to the place, if you want, I think this, there's an ambiguity there. And uh, I will finish with a quote by uh, a, philosoph a Jewish philosopher, it's called Emmanuel Levinas. Uh, it's a funny title, it's called Heidegger, Gagarin, and Us. Uh, why? So he says, once in the, in the life, uh, at the time when he wrote this article, he says, once a man was able to see the world without a place. And it's Gagarin who was in space, in the middle of space, without any horizon, having space above, around him, everywhere, and not anymore related to a space, uh, uh, to, to a place, to a, to a specific endroit, to a space. Uh. And he says this experience was possible through technology, uh, and because of that, it have, uh, uh, 
suppress the privilege of being attached or rooted in one place and also of the exile who goes with it, uh, of the feeling of exile that could go with it. And this freedom from the place, he, he says, this is a kind of one of the most fantastic experience of, of the man of today, that possibility of detach himself. Because remember, the attachment to a place is also what divide us in a way. Uh, and uh, the, this ambiguity of dividing people, belonging, and strangers, uh, this is what make our uh, division still and make uh, us uh, this uh, uh, difficulty of uh, coexistence and all that. Uh, and also, Lemieux, uh, I think I've uh, felt the, these things from inside profoundly, and that's why I call him a kind of metaphysical painter, but on the other hand, the choice he made I think it's not toward technique, it's not toward this kind of <laughs> uh, to be in space uh, and having absolutely no relation whatsoever with, with one place or the other. It's in the other sense, and it's more nostalgic, more romantic in a way, and also, in, in my opinion, a little bit more ambiguous. Okay, finish with that. Mm -hmm.